10 minutes. Here we go. 10 plus zero. Yeah, we might we might have to restart the speedrun pretty soon, but I'm down for like one or two more games on this account. Here we go. 2281 Stockfish Gaming 69. Joined three days ago. Um okay. Looks like looks like he's legit though, because he's played a lot of standard games. Okay. Yeah, he's played a lot of standard games. Let's keep going. All right, so we're gonna get a Night Arf in. Knight F6, Knight C. Finally, we get a mainline Knight Arf. It's been a while. We we constantly face uh anti-Sicilians, but at this level, the open Sicilian becomes very, very popular. F3. Okay, so we have faced this line exactly once in the speedrun. Uh, this was that was a very technical speedrun video where I really delved deeply into the theory of what's called the English attack. And in the English attack, White plays this early F3 move, generally develops the bishop to E3, then plays Queen D2 Long Castle, and then essentially sends his pawns down the king side. And and, and you get the kind of stereotypical knight of battle where black attacks on the queen side and white attacks on the king side. But bishop E2 is a more modest approach. Uh, it's not a particularly dangerous move. I mean, it's not all that great for white to combine uh, to combine the move F3 and short castle because it is it is a relatively weakening move, but it's obviously not the end of the world. So black is not like much better or anything. We should just continue playing normally. And I'm going to continue developing my pieces as is kind of customary in the night orf, where typically the knight heads to D7. Rare is the instance where you develop the knight to C6. And there's positional reasons for that that I'll get into after the game. But black is already a good position out of the opening. Typically, uh, essentially, white is combining two different variations. One is the quiet, the Karpov variation, bishop e2. And the other is the English attack. And sometimes when you mix two lines, uh, you get kind of a mishmash and you give your opponent comfortable play. Queen d2. OK, so let's continue making marginal improving moves. I like the look of rook c8. I like the look of the typical knight orf move b5. Of course, when you play b5, you have to be very careful uh, not to allow a4, which can lead to a very unpleasant dissolution of your king, uh, queen side. So let's start with a more non-committal improving move, rook c8, and knight d5. Okay, so here we have a choice. We can take with a knight, and after e takes d5, we can park our bishop on f5. This is typically how I've been taught to respond to this move. We can also, of course, take with the bishop, and after e takes d5, we can start playing positionally on the king's side. I think both options uh, contain a good deal of sense, but I think the standard approach is knight takes d5, ed, and bishop f5, maintaining the bishop pair. And now the plan, well, first of all, the c-pawn is hanging, so presumably our opponent is going to go c4. And then th the plan that I was taught when I was first learning the knight orf is to drop this bishop back to g6 and to quickly send our kingside pawns up the board. So we almost get, in effect, a reverse English attack where white is going to play on the queen side and we are going to play on the king side, which I have no problems with as a King's Indian player. I prefer to play against my opponent's king. Okay, so bishop g6. Now, I'm anticipating c4, but the catch is that we don't just have to close our eyes and, you know, pray that nothing's going to happen on the, on the queen side. We can actively try to hurt white's chances on the queen side. So a4 is a really high-level move because c4 could have been met with b6, slowing down the progress of white's pawns. a4 is a very good prophylactic move. Right now, b6 doesn't work because it uh, blunders the a6 pawn. And after white plays c4, if we go b6 then, then white can undermine our, our queen side blockade with a5. So we have no, nothing better to do than to uh, initiate our own king side attack. Let's go f5. And we're just going to send our, our center pawns down the board. Very likely, we're going to play f4 followed by e4, or even in some instances, e4 followed by f4. Now, g3 is really asking for it. It's really asking f for it. Now, e4 here is very ineffective because it weakens the d4 square. It gives the knight a potential outpost on e6. I do like f4 a lot more, and it usually isn't even a question. You kind of have to play f4. In this situation, even without calculating, this just looks like the right move, opening up our opponent's king and leading to direct tactical confrontation. So we're going to have to do some heavy calculation here, especially because I'm lower on time. So, okay, EF bishop f4. I have to calculate in silence for a bit here because we don't actually have to play e takes f4. We can keep the pawn on e5 and make a an improving move, such as bishop h5. Okay, I have a cool idea. All right, let's take. Let's take um, 
Ah, our opponent also can play bishop f2, but he takes an f4. And now I'm really hoping that this works out. Let's centralize our knight. I'm really hoping for knight d4. I think that's the move that most people would play here is knight d4 heading for e6. But I believe that knight d4 is a blunder for a very instructive tactical reason. So I'm really, really hoping that we get knight d4 here. Now, if our opponent takes on e5, then we take back with a pawn. And I'm getting what I want, which is control of the dark squares on the king side, as well as uh, the pawn on e5 restricting the knight on b3, preventing it from moving to d4, which is would be very beneficial to us. The move that I would play with white, very high level move, is something like king h1. Okay, so this guy is strong title player strength. Okay, so king h1. Knight c4 is possible, takes, takes. Knight c4, takes, takes. Hmm. Looks very promising, but it's hard, hard to actually find a follow-up here. And it feels like I'm getting outplayed in every speedrun game the last, like, 30 games. Okay, what about queen d7, queen h3? This is an interesting idea, too. Yeah, let's go queen d7 and try to implement and, and, and more directly involve the queen in the attack via h3. Yeah, very sharp position. I mean, I in, in Blitz, I really like black here because we have easy ways to continue attacking. On the other hand, we're down a pawn. And obviously, there's this very big weakness on e6. So we really, really, I mean, if we allow the knight to get to e6, especially if it shuts off our queen, that would be really bad news, which is why I'm playing queen d7. I'm trying to slide the queen into the attack kind of before the, the gates close. So if our queen is already on h3, wow, c3, that looks wrong. That looks wrong, but I can't put my finger on why. It is not a move that I would play. Queen h3, I guess, is logical to start with, involving the queen. Yeah, if we're given a move, uh, we could lift the rook up to h5, but I'm assuming he's going to go knight d4. Okay, he takes on e5. Interesting. Well, generally, this is what we want, but obviously the situation has changed a little bit. Now, d6 is possible. Okay, so rook f3 doesn't work. d6 doesn't work. Unfortunately, we don't have bishop g5 here, which we used to. That's a bit of a problem. Bishop h4 comes to mind. Yeah, bishop h4 very much comes to mind. Rook d8, also possible. Wait, rook fd8. Queen d5 check, bishop f7. Yeah, rook fd8 might be the clinical approach here. Rook cd8, there's cd. That's bad. But rook fd8 might be a nice way to pick off this pawn. I really don't know. Bishop h4, also possible. But I really don't want to let this pawn live any longer than we have to. Okay, let's go rook fd8. Trying to pick up, thank you, GM Chica to Cowboy Dixon, trying to pick up the d6 pawn. We're also trying to pick up in a way such that our attack on h2 increases. If we take it with the bishop, then we'll have the later possibility of pushing e4 and opening up a direct attack on h2. So if white doesn't come up with anything super concrete right now and we're able to win back this pawn, then we're doing amazingly. The, the pawn count could not be more irrelevant here. That's not the point. Okay, rook d1 is a good, is a great sign. Now we could take with the rook. I think a lot of people would be tempted by this move, but as I've already explained, the thematically correct move is bishop takes d6 because it sets up the idea of e4. On the other hand, this move does not come with tempo. But my intuition tells me to play bishop takes d6. Now e4 is a very, very powerful idea. I wouldn't necessarily call it a threat, but it's a very strong idea. Note that queen d5 check is never dangerous because we can always block with our other bishop, bishop f7, and the knight on b3 is also left hanging in many of these variations. Thank you for the sub. Distant, 187. Very high tension position, but I really feel like our attacking chances should outweigh white's pressure in the center. Okay. There was a lot to unpack there in the last couple of moves. I know that I was a little wishy-washy about some of the variations, but that's just because I didn't have time to spell them out. I'll show a couple of them after the game. Queen g5, okay. Queen g5, interesting move. Bishop c2, no, that doesn't look right. What about e4? e4, f4, e3. Man, that looks very promising. And e4 has to be the right move. E4, rook d6, rook d6. On the other hand, e4, f4 threatens bishop g4. 4, f4, e3, rook d4. Gosh, somehow he holds on there. Now, queen g5 is an excellent move. I might also just want to drop back to e6 here. 
yeah, let's go queen e6. I think this is the more practical approach. Um, e4, I didn't like the look of f4. This move I like because it also hits what? Oh my gosh, that's insane. Okay, knight c5. It's not the end of the world. Now, I can't take with either piece. Of course, I didn't see that. It's way beyond my pay grade. I'll go queen f7. I think we're holding on here. <clears throat> yeah, we're holding on here. Okay, bishop c7. I didn't want to play bishop e7 because that would have dropped the e5 pawn, and I really don't want to give away this pawn. Okay, takes, takes. Now I think uh, black is doing quite fine, but we're low on time, and I'm going to have to be super precise. Rook d1. Okay, so takes, 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 and I don't quite get what I want. In the interest of time, I think trading in something like queen c4 is the most practical approach. Trading in h6 is also possible. Yeah, definitely I think we should trade. Okay, a very difficult decision now by our opponent, requiring some thought. So now let's go h6 and chase away the queen. Also, I want to create a luft square for our king on h7. And definitely feels like black is slightly better here because he's got these weak pawns. He's got the long-term weakness of his king, which could cost him even without the rooks on the board. Queen e3. I think we're going to go king h7, tucking away the king on what I think is probably the safest square on the board because the knight is completely restricted. He's never going to have knight g5. Knight f2. Okay. Now queen c4 feels right. Activating the queen. Activating the queen. I would really love to put my bishop on b6. If that bishop starts firing on this diagonal, that would be amazing. Now that becomes possible. The issue, though, is bishop c2. I really didn't want to allow the trade of, of bishops, and I missed. Yeah, that was a mistake by me. Probably even trading might be the most prudent option. It's a, oh, I can actually go queen f4. Wait a second. Queen f4, bishop c2. I have queen, uh, queen c1. Okay, so I found a way to keep the, the bishop bear alive. And we're continuing to put pressure. Knight h3. What is going on here? Queen c1 has to be the move. Optimizing the activity of the queen. And our next move is likely to be bishop b6 to get this bishop active. I'm assuming he's going to go king g2 and unpin his king. I mean, that's what most people would do. That's what I would do. Knight f2. Jeez. b2. Okay, bishop b6. I have no real other way to improve my position. And knight d3, queen g5 is very important because there's a mate threat on g1. So a lot of threats being created here. And a lot of tactics are kind of brewing in this position. The, the issue is, if he plays a move like knight e4, the question becomes, okay, how do I actually convert my superior piece activity into, and of course he plays it, into a winning advantage? So I'm just going to keep poking and prodding and try to milk his clock down um, and, and keep creating threats, following Smyslov's advice. If you create 40 threats, eventually your opponent's going to buckle. Although this guy doesn't seem to have any plans of buckling. Let's go king h8, unpinning the king or unpinning the bishop. Now I'm setting up bishop h5 which would put pressure on this pawn. Queen d1, I think bishop h5 is sensible to attack f3. Unfortunately, he's got king g2. He's defending extremely well. But the clock situation is now even. What am I going to do if he plays king g2, though? I don't quite know. King g2 is basically automatic, I think. Maybe queen e3, setting up threats on this long diagonal. The very important detail, the bishop is guarding d8. If it wasn't, queen d8 would be immediate checkmate because king h7 there's knight g5 mate double attack on the king i i really like the look of a move like queen e3 just kind of squeezing my way into some of these weak squares he's taking a really long time here it's a good sign i think this game might be decided on the clock our opponent's time usage feels very unnatural to me i'm gonna be honest here king g2 is a completely automatic move for anybody over like 1600 there are no other ways to defend f3 so it could be an internet problem but I don't know what's going on. Knight d2. Okay, that is suicidal. Th that is, I mean, even queen takes d2 is possible, but queen d2, queen d2, bishop f3, there's queen g2. But th that is a un unthinkable move just because of bishop e3. I, I don't understand that moment at all. This is going to lose. White is losing. Just bishop d2. That's it. We're up a piece. Yeah. Bit of a strange resolution, and he resigns. Bit of a strange resolution, but an interesting game overall. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason I kind of want to start a new speed. And a lot of these recent games, to be honest, I mean, as you can see, are, are weird. 
uh, time usage was weird. Some of the moves were weird. The fact that he played knight c5 instantly, but spent, you know, a minute on a move that anybody over 1400 would never play. Yes, a little bit strange. Uh, but king g2 is, is, is just automatic, and the position is equal after queen e3, according to the engine. So, anyways, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So, I'm gonna, uh, because this game is very complex, I'm going to load it into chess space and uh, turn on Stockfish there because it's worthy of closer analysis. The accuracy was 85.3 to 89.6. So, I played quite decently. Um, and we had a knight arf. So, f3, e5, knight b3, bishop e6, bishop e3, bishop e7 is all theoretical. Bishop e2 is a, a side move. Again, it's it's not a mistake, but it's just not considered the most ambitious line. I'll direct you to the previous speedrun game where we did face queen d2, castles, castles, and here are the move that I really, really like to play. This is a sideline, and I play this very successfully even against GMs and Blitz. It's this weird-looking move, a5, just trying to send the a pawn up the board. The main line here uh, is, or sorry, it's not b5, it's knight bd7. And now you have this crazy line that goes g4, b5, g5, b4, pandemonium, a lot of theory. And I went into this in the previous uh, Night Arf speedrun game, so I'm not going to do it again. But suffice it to say that a5 is my sort of official recommendation here because a lot of people don't know what to do against this move at all levels. Um, black is worse after a5 if white demonstrates you know, big precision, but it's a very, very dangerous sideline. Um, most people play bishop b5 here to stop a4, and already after knight a6, I think black's position is quite good. Uh, the best move is a4, but not a lot of people kind of have the guts to push upon where their king is, and it also weakens the b4 square. Um, so bishop b2 uh, was has been played a million times, of course. Uh, again, can't call this move a mistake. It takes the game kind of out of theory. Okay, so castles, castles, kingside. And by transposition, we get a position that could have occurred via the move order bishop e2. So if white had started with bishop e2, after e5, knight b3, uh, typically black starts with bishop e7 in this line, and there's kind of a, a nuanced reason for that. But here the line, one of the main lines, does go bishop e3, bishop e6, castles, castles. But in this position, f3 is not a very ambitious move, and it's easier to see that when you have this position. I mean, here, f4 is a line, queen d2 is a line, but f3 is kind of a weird move because it's not very necessary to protect the e4 pawn in this line. Black's not really putting pressure on that pawn. So we kind of get what we want here. Of course, again, the position is still equal. So knight bd7, queen d2. The main move, according to uh, reference on, on chess base, is in fact b5. Uh, I rejected b5 because of a4. Um, b4... Knight d5, but here there is a very important subtlety. So after bishop takes d5, e takes d5, uh, if you give white like one more move to, to play the move a5, then the knight on d7 is completely restricted and these pawns become isolated. But because black has the tempo, you have a very important move here. Just, can anybody name it? And I've given you a very big hint, of course. So it's not a5. It's not a5. Why not a5? The problem with the move a5 is that white can play c3. And you're like, well, why is c3 so dangerous? Well, after you trade, white is going to once again play c4, creating a very secure pawn chain and orchestrating long-term pressure on the a5 pawn, which is going to be very unpleasant. Also, black is very cramped. And the issue is that if you play knight b6 now, you are just not in time. White plays c4, and already this pawn is hanging. So it's very important to play this move knight to b6 here. And you, this is a, a classic idea in the Night Arf. I, I should have seen this. Now, white is not in time to play c4 because of en passant and you take d5. And you might say, well, what's the problem? White can just play bishop b6. But giving away the dark squared bishop uh, in these types of structures is generally very bad for white because white's got a lot of dark square weaknesses, partially due to the move f3. So after king h1, you could bring the rook into c8. Um, now, again, white cannot play c4 this time because the knight is going to hang. So what is white going to do? Probably a5. There are still games in the database. You will not believe this. You will not believe what I am seeing right now. This position occurred in the game John Jaffray versus Alan Naroditsky. That's my brother in 2009. 
with this exact move order. I can't believe this. Oh my gosh. And the game ended in a draw pretty quickly. That's crazy. Uh, San Francisco 2009. Now, my brother was 2052 when this game was played. Yeah, so we <laughs> we have a lot in common. Except he, after Rook FD1, he played the move Knight D7, which is actually not a bad move. But according to the engine, you should start expanding on the king side with G6. And, and King G7, H5, you know, play like a Soviet schoolboy on the king side. And uh, if Rook A4 then you can always protect the pawn with rook ab8. I'm, I'm going to text him this. This is insane. I mean, what are the odds of that? Um, of course, we both play the knight arf at that point, but that's that's remarkable. Uh, currently in 2100, but he doesn't play anymore. Let's see if I can find... Yeah, I, I also had a similar game, but I'm not going to bother finding it right now. In any case, pretty crazy. Uh, last thing, after knight b6... If white plays queen takes b4, then, of course, you play knight b takes d5. And this is a very favorable trade for black because the queen has to drop back. You take the bishop. And now you have a very nice maneuver, knight d5, and the knight sinks its teeth into f4. Queen b6 is coming. Black is better. So I think the best move probably would have been b5. And then you can continue if white doesn't play a4. If white plays a3, for instance, uh, you can play rook c8 or you can play knight b6 and knight c4. Black has kind of a dream knight arf. So instead, rook c8, knight d5. So now, once again, I played the wrong. Here, I made a mistake. Uh, knight takes d5 gives away the advantage. And uh, this is just sort of my standard reaction to knight d5. But once again, after bishop d5 ed, I completely forgot about the prospect of knight b6. I just kind of assumed that white's going to go c4. And uh, if black plays b5 in this position, uh, you're giving away the a5 square. Also, you're allowing a4. And in this version, this is a this is an inferior version for black. In 2009, I was already stronger than, than my brother. So knight takes d5 a little bit sloppy. Now the position is probably dynamically balanced. Okay, so rook fc1. There's still a game in the database here, but rook fc1 is a weird move. I feel like most people would play c4. And here my idea was to play b6. And if white plays a4... A very instructive situation occurs after a5. Notice that white is completely stuck along the dark squares. You essentially can never push c5. The reason is because you can't push b4, because black is controlling both of the key dark squares. This also happens sometimes in the King's Indian. It can be compared to a situation that often happens in the King's Indian, where um, let's just take a sample line. For instance, d5, knight c5. I had this earlier today in a blitz game. So here, if white plays a3, you get kind of a uh, similar situation. The worst thing to do for white would be to play a4. Like, the old chess engines used to recommend moves like a4, but the queen side is now completely frozen because b4 is never going to be effective, and black's hands are essentially untied for kingside action. So from that perspective, I think rook fc1 is a really good move uh, because it maintains queenside flexibility. Um, only one game in the database here. Okay, so bishop g6, I think, is a good move, preparing f5. White plays a4. Now, once again, if white had played c4, we would have stopped the further progression of the pawn with b6. Yeah, of course, white can surpass the blockade, but it takes a million moves, and those million moves give us the opportunity to develop kingside play. So the benefit of a4, as I explained, is white essentially wants to push a5, preventing the b-pawn from moving forward, and only then does white want to send the c-pawn in motion. So we have to get down to business, which we did, f5, and g3 is a very strange move. And this has to be a mistake, because this allows us to ignite to ignite the king side. Again, I, g3 is a very unnatural move to me. I think c4 was called for. And uh, the computer gives a very interesting move here for black, bishop h4, which I actually really like, because you're setting up the threat of f4. And you might say, well, why is f4 a threat? Let's say white plays a5. You play f4. I guess bishop a7 is possible, but that's very scary. And if white plays bishop f2, then you take on f2, and you play the move e4. And in these types of situations, e4 is extremely strong, not only because it opens up the king side, but also because it gives the knight uh, this incredible square on e5. And here the attack becomes extremely strong. Everything is coming out to its proper positions. So just remember this idea of 
starting with bishop h4 and and only then playing up four. Probably white should play a move like king h1 here to, to open up the g1 square for the bishop, but still f4, bishop g1, and once again e4. f takes e4, and here you can play knight e5, you can even play knight f6 and knight takes e4. From a practical standpoint, black's position is amazing. The attack is very, very strong, and that should kind of make sense to you. Someone was asking, what happens if white plays f4 and tries to physically prevent? Yeah, f4 is not a bad move, but what square does f4 weaken? Well, it weakens the e4 square, so I would play knight f6 here, aiming the knight to e4, and this is merely a temporary stopgap. Black's pieces are extremely active. So, for example, a5, knight e4, and remember that you're not, you haven't sacrificed anything, so it's not like you have to play only on the king's side. You can also make a neutral move like bishop f6 and just kind of accumulate the pieces nicely in the center. And white's just too slow. By the time white actually sends the c-pawn in motion, already the situation, the position is already collapsing. So, you know, keep that in mind. Mm, yeah, so g3, f4 kind of is called for, exploding the king's side. But somewhere here, I made a mistake. So takes, takes, takes. Knight e5 is actually the top engine move. And I think the critical position occurs after king h1. I think the critical position occurs after king h1. Now, to some people, it might be tempting to play rook f4 and bishop g5. This is a nice looking tactic, but remember, it's just a trade. You're actually allowing white to take on d6, and you're not actually gaining anything from this operation. So you're not writing a tactics book, as my coach would say. You're trying to win the game. Now, one very important detail. If white had played knight d4 here, who can tell me the entire winning variation for black? Not just the next move, but what's like the final move of the sequence? This is on the theme of just because a move is ineffective in one position doesn't mean you need to stop considering it in all positions. Good time to pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah, so the move is rook takes f4. Now, one important detail. If white starts with knight e6 intermezzo, you have queen b6 check, and this is the direct result of white playing that move f3. This is why weakening squares and diagonals in the long run can cost you, because the tactics don't go your way. If queen takes f4, bishop g5, white no longer has moves along this diagonal. The queen has to drop back. And now the key move is bishop e3 check. You pick up the knight, and you're completely winning. You have two pieces for a rook and just total min minor piece domination. But this was an important detail. But our opponent saw through it, and he played king h1. I think that's a good move. And here, apparently, I made a... No, actually, queen d7 is a decent move. According to the computer, the best move would have been knight to c4. This is a difficult move to play because you are giving away your very strong knight. What is the idea of this move? Well, white has to take. Otherwise, white drops the bishop. And if white plays queen to d4, then bishop f6 is crushing. Now, what is the consequence of this trade? Well, first of all, the rook laterally gets into the action, hitting the bishop from both sides. Second of all, and mainly, the f3 pawn is now a much more attackable target. So white has to play knight d4, intercepting the attack on the bishop. Because if the bishop had moved instead, then you would have taken on f3. And here the floodgates really open. Bishop b4 is coming, bishop g5, etc. And here a very important move. Uh, bishop h4. This I missed. I, I saw knight c4, and I kind of stopped here. And I figured, oh, you know, the knight's coming to e6. This is really unpleasant. But bishop h4 is a key detail, very, very high level. Now you might say, well, how does this stop knight e6? Well, now you play queen f6. The queen is able to slide into the attack. And if white plays knight takes f8, then you simply recapture on f8 and you're winning. Because now the bishop is hanging. And if the bishop moves back, then all hell breaks loose. Queen takes f3 check. White has to block with a queen. And now a sexy retreating move, queen to h5. And just look at the light square weaknesses. The bishop is coming to e4, and white is unable to cover all the bases. If white plays rook e1, then the rook comes into c2. Beautiful harmony of, of black's pieces here. Everything on the perfect square. When you analyze with the engine, you always find this to be the case. Like somehow the pieces are always on the perfect squares. Now you might say, well, what if white doesn't take the rook? Well, white has no choice because our next move is rook takes f4. We're going to take the bishop, and we have enough, enough attackers liquidating into a completely winning endgame. Two bishops for a rook, and everything's collapsing. So all of this hinges on this bishop h4 move, which I missed, 
kind of getting the bishop out of the way to pave the way for the queen to join the attack. An instructive idea to put into your toolkit. Now, more commonly, you see the bishop kind of dropping back to f8, uh, but here it's impossible because f8 is blocked. So you actually make a move along the same diagonal. Now, where do you see this sometimes? What would I compare this to? I would compare this to the following. Let me see if I can find an example. Okay, yeah, so very primitive example, just quickly, but still, it'll, it'll illustrate the point. Okay, so uh, Czech Republic Championship 1907. Classic. Um, so here, after king f1, f takes g5, it's the same type of technique where when the bishop is in front of the queen, you want it to be the other way around. So you engineer that bishop takes h7, and on the next move, the queen slides into g6, kind of the same type of idea. Here, it's much more evident that this is good because you're just winning everything, essentially. Anyways, that's kind of the technique to, to keep in mind. Let's go back to the game. So I missed this, and instead I played queen d7. I had the right idea to get the queen involved, but not the best execution. Now, c3 is a very strange move. Our opponent does not respond to any of the threats. Knight d4 was called for. And after c3, I'm very mad at myself because I played a very impulsive and very bad move. This is a good example of tunnel vision. I had already set my sights on h3, and I didn't ask myself, where else can the queen go along this diagonal? What would have been a much more effective way to force white to do what we want to do. Are there any alternatives? And okay, now that I ask you, the move should be obvious. Yeah, so again, it's this, I didn't pay enough attention to the f3 pawn, queen f5. So bishop takes e5 is forced, and now bishop to g5 intermezzo. Lovely attacking motif. If the queen drops back, then we can simply take the rook, and white's losing a ton of material. Bishop takes d6, bishop takes b2, hitting the other rook. Very nice. And then bishop takes c3, hitting the queen. If white plays f4, trying to intercept and hit the bishop, that gives away the e4 square. Queen e4 check, king g1, and rook takes f4. Beautiful. Again, the bishops are just killer in this situation. The diagonal attackers. For example, queen d3, check, here, and checkmate. Yeah, that's, that's how you're supposed to attack. Ridiculous. Um, so queen f5 was missed. Or I saw this out of the corner of my... I didn't see bishop g5. I didn't see the intermezzo. Because if, if black plays d takes e5 here, that gives white a necessary tempo that he can use to bring defenders uh, to the right squares. And now bishop g5 is no longer possible. The attack is less convincing. Okay, one second. Sorry, I had to refresh because... Okay, so instead queen h3. And already after bishop takes e5 and d6, the situation is a lot more complex. Uh, here, rook fd8 was a very important detail. Not kind of in your mind separating the board, but understanding that everything is related. Rook fd8 was a tough move to play because I was really in love with the idea of sacking on f3, but I realized that it wasn't feasible because any time you play rook takes f3, first of all, there's this check on d5 that's very, very nasty, and second of all, the bishop can take and then the queen can block. So instead, rook fd8. Why not rook cd8 because of d takes e7? And white gets way too much material for the queen. Two rooks and a piece. So here, it was very important to note the tactics. And after rook fd, once again, black is, has a stable advantage. Here, here, queen g5 was a very nice move, though, by our opponent. And here, e4 uh, runs into f4, threatening bishop g4. And I just thought this was a super, super messy position. e3, rook d4, and apparently it's equal. So it was very good in foresight by our opponent to, to play this move, queen g5, kind of covering a bunch of important squares on the king's side. Yeah, so I kind of mentioned bishop c2, and I rejected this intuitively. It just looks way too flimsy. And at the very least, white has the move rook g1, and also at the very most, hitting g7, and now the knight can drop back to d2 and maneuver to e4, and, and the bishop is very misplaced. So, so as I explained, rook takes d6 would have been possible, and according to the computer, rook takes d6 would have been preferable, followed by rook to f6, re-involving the rook. But I was really enthralled with the idea of pushing e4. I just missed queen g5. This is just a nice defensive move. This is very concrete. I wouldn't call this instructive. These moments in the game are just completely predicated on concrete variations. There's no necessarily logic behind them. Like, why does this fail? Just because of the specifics of the position. Because white's pieces are at the right spots at the right time. 
And this is what you have to understand about chess at this level. A lot of it is going to come down to these, these concrete details, including knight c5, which is an incredible move, which I, of course, completely missed using the pin against the bishop. And once the knight gets to e4, I think white has completely stabilized. Probably black is maybe a smidge better, but not much. And the engine actually gives equality. So after bishop c7, we trade at rooks. The game is starting to head toward a draw. Once again, very good insight by our opponent, noticing that this is not checkmate. The queen can block and white is completely safe. So once again, very accurate. h6, queen e3, king h7. So here I was trying to put some pressure. Queen c4, activating the queen. Yeah, as far as I understand, our opponent was defending very accurately. I would play knight e4 here. I would never go knight h3. I would keep this knight on e4 to keep this bishop at bay. But somehow he went to h3, allowing our queen to infiltrate. Knight back to f2. This should be 694, so still very reasonable defense. And really up until bishop c2, king h8, of course, if you play bishop h5 immediately, you run into the double check. So up until this moment, after king g2, the position is equal. So just a completely mind-boggling blunder at the end of the game after such a nice defense. Here the engine gives b4, a5, takes, takes, knight back to g3. I mean, it's just an equal endgame. It's, it's, just, it's just an equal position. This is likely to liquidate into a draw. So yeah, knight d2 was just unthinkable. Obviously, this allows bishop e3, and the game ends immediately because f3 hangs likely with uh, Pillsbury mate. So yeah, a little bit of an anticlimactic finale, but the interesting part of the game was like the early middle game. When I got that attack, I started off very accurately with knight e5, very patient move, but then missing bishop h4, and then missing queen to f5 and bishop g5, which tells you how hard it is to attack accurately, and you shouldn't feel bad if your attacks fail. Attacking is probably the hardest stage of the game. Um, but yeah, super fun stuff. Another knight arf win. Yeah, this line definitely was not dangerous from a theoretical standpoint, but hopefully if you're a knight arf player, you're also now well, well acquainted at how to play these types of structures. Remember this knight b6 idea? Um, I definitely needed a refresher on this idea. So the, the key here is to determine whether white can play c4. If white can play c4, this is not effective. But here, white can't play c4. And on that, I think we are going to wrap up for today. I hope you enjoyed the game. This will be on YouTube pretty soon. Thanks, everybody, for watching.